Hi everyone, my name, welcome to the BioBus Student Town Hall Live, run entirely by the high school interns here at BioBus. My name is Lauren and I'm a junior scientist who works at BioBus and I'll be one of your hosts today. Hi, my name is Mia and I will be your other host today. We also have Cece and Ivy here who will be taking questions from the chat. We are all junior scientists who work with BioBus. I first want to identify this mystery microscope image. Do you figure out what it is? This picture is a close-up of an egg that sat in vinegar for approximately two days. The eggshell absorbed the vinegar and dissolved the hard shell, which, may, which is made of calcium and carbonate, leaving the egg's membrane behind. Isn't that super cool? If you want more science to do, check out the Explore at Home Science Challenges and make sure to look up for future challenges with eggs and osmosis. At BioBuzz, we love to use microscopes. We would also like to give a shout out to our amazing team of 11 junior scientists who helped write and produce this town hall. BioBuzz is an education nonprofit building a scientific community for everyone by bringing scientists and students together to discover, explore, and pursue science. We're based in New York City where we operate two mobile laboratories the biobuses with microscopes, which you might have seen or even been on, and one state-of-the-art community laboratory, the biobase in Harlem by the one train at MLK. Come do some science with us when those spaces open again. Stay till the end to learn more about our different programs. Enjoy! The topic it today is food science, and we have two wonderful guest scientists to answer all questions. Dr. Laura Boken is a biologist who works with genes and DNA in order to help farmers around the world grow crops that will make us sick. Dr. Stephen Chiquel is a PhD in nutrition and metabolic biology and is on a mission to challenge the way people interact and think about food. Hi. Basically, basically they're scientists who study food and try to find ways to help benefit society and all of our humankind. Steven and Laura, welcome to the Viva Town Hall. Could you each tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm sick. Dr. Steven Chicot is a PhD in nutrition and metabolic biology and is on a mission to challenge the way people interact and think about food. Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself? Is that, is that me? Is that me now? <laughs> Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Boykin, and I am a computational biologist, which means I like computers and I like biology and putting them together as a job. So that's what I do. Um, I'm a senior TED fellow, and um, I'm currently working on a project called the Cassava Virus Action Project, which is a bunch of scientists, technologists, um, farmers. And our, our big mission is to save this plant called cassava, which feeds 800 million people globally. So we're trying to use all sorts of high-tech portable genomic gadgets um, on the farm to help smallholder farmers. We're focusing now in East Africa. So that's Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya. And um, we're working really hard with farmers. We're working really hard with scientists on the ground. And really the big questions that we're interested in are, you know, why are farmers hungry? And how can we use technology to help farmers grow more food? And also this idea of places in the world where there's food waste and there are people on the planet who need food. Like how do, we, how do we work as a planet to get those things aligned? And one of the things I'm really passionate about is every bit of science that we do is wrapped in social justice. So I'm really curious as to why the majority of food scientists and policymakers are white guys and the majority of the farmers are not white guys. They're mainly women of color. So I'm really interested in um, increasing inclusion in, in science and getting people at the table solves big problems. So um, I just, I think that science and technology is amazing and communicating it is even better. So I'm just really happy to be here today. Uh, hi, I'm Steven. I thank you so much, 
Laura, that's amazing. Very happy to be speaking alongside you. Um, and like Mia said, I'm, I'm Stephen and I got my PhD at, uh, at Columbia in nutrition and metabolic biology. Uh, I worked in the Kusteni lab studying energy regulation by the skeleton. I spent a lot of time thinking about bones and how they interact with our diet and food. Um, it turns out that our skeletons are very much alive and they need food and they have the ability to communicate to other parts of the body by secreting hormones. And I was studying one of these hormones um, using mouse models. So here's a mouse that doesn't have any of this hormone that I was studying called lipocalin 2 in only its bones. And by studying this mouse, mouse and studying um, feeding behavior and its biology, I was able to learn a lot about this protein and about bones themselves. So when we eat a taco, as seen in the, this image in, in the middle, um, our bones are also eating food and respond by secreting this protein, lipocalin 2, where it can signal to the brain to tell you that, okay, you've eaten and now you're full. And it can also signal to the pancreas to tell it to secrete more insulin and to produce more, more insulin. Uh, after I finished my PhD, I wanted to take a step back from the lab and get more in touch with people and not just mice and really understand nutrition and biology on a personal level. So I did the most logical thing and I started a company and became a chef. Uh, this company is called Eight, and it stands for Aggregate, Integrate to Educate. And it's all about learning about yourself and learning about your biology. Uh, I'm starting to develop some curriculums to teach scientific concepts through experiments in the kitchen. Um, I'm also cooking a lot, catering. I was Before COVID, I was catering immersive theater events and weddings and hosting dinner parties. And these dinner parties were dedicated towards bringing diverse sets of people around a table and asking um, big questions about the future of food, the future of healthcare and science and our, our, place, our place in it. Um, so like I, like I was saying, at these dinner parties, I was asking some big questions, but also questions that we tend to maybe not, not think um, as, as, as much about like really basic questions like what is food? What is eating? What are nutrients? What is digestion? What is metabolism? And what is cooking? Um, so I'm, I'm hopefully going to be here to uh, answer some of these questions and answer your questions. And I'm super happy to be here. Thank you. We also have Biobus Junior Sciences, CC and Ivy here in the chat who will be collecting your questions. So ask anything you want to know in the chat. Can you introduce yourself and tell us what's your favorite food and why? Hi everyone, my name is Cece. I am a junior bio, I am a junior scientist here at Biobus. Uh, sorry, um, my, I don't have a favorite food though I do have a favorite food fact. Uh, did you guys know that pistachios come from fruits? I bet you guys didn't know that. Uh, Ivy, what about you? Hello, I'm Ivy and I'm also a junior scientist at Biobus. And my favorite food, well, my favorite category of food is desserts because I have a really sweet tooth. And my favorite dessert will, might be tiramisu. Nice. So you guys all submitted some amazing questions ahead of time that me and I will be asking to our guest scientists. But remember, we also will be taking questions from the chat. So if you're curious about something, put it in the chat so we can ask your questions to the scientists. Tell us your name, age, and school. Okay, so scientists, you have about two minutes to answer each question. If you start running out of time, my co-host. Or my co-host will appear that means wrap it up so that we can go and answer more questions from our curious scientists in our community. Okay, so our first questions are on the topic of how food impacts the body, which is Stephen's specialty. So Stephen, here's some questions for you. Our first question is from Kanokwan, who is 40, and they ask, why does food come for us when we are un undergoing emotional experiences? And why do certain foods change your overall mood? That's a question that was asked by Cecilia, who is 17. 
Uh, it's a really, really great question. It really hits on um, this idea that food and mood are, are intimately intertwined. So um, we, we get these cravings when, when we're hungry and the like hung, hunger can be uh, like this can be a little bit painful and, and uncomfortable. Uh, and it's it's telling us to it's tell our it's our body's way to tell your brain that maybe we should go and and feed it and and give it what what it wants. So when we put in the work to get the food, so in today's society that might be calling seamless, but uh, other people are are foraging for berries and mushrooms or or hunting or um, or farming. Um, when, when you put in that effort and you're finally rewarded with sitting down and eating the food, it feels good. It, it feels, you feel satiated and you feel filled. Um, and it just like, it hits, it hits the spot. So um, that's, that's your brain now giving you positive reinforcement to feel good. It's a, it's a pleasurable sensation to eat. Um, and that's that's why you feel comfortable after you've eaten. That's so cool. So we have another question from who's from Ian, who is seven, and they ask, is it true that eating carrots can improve our eyesight? And how exactly are vegetables good for your body? It's also for me, right? Yeah. Um, wow, it's such a great question too. I'm gonna first do the second question first. So how exactly are vegetables good for your body? Um, so vegetables are foods that are coming from plants and they have specific nutrients that are in the food that your body needs. Specifically, vegetables are high in micronutrients, so all your vitamins and minerals, and they're high in fiber. And fiber keeps the gut microbes, the bacteria that live inside you really happy. So eating vegetables directly feeds your bacteria, feeds you, and is giving you the nutrients that you need to survive and continue um, doing the things that you want to be doing. And carrots specifically are super important because they, they are very high in this chemical called beta-carotene, beta-carotene. And this, protein, this molecule, it's not a protein, this molecule, beta-carotene, um, is a precursor molecule that then will turn into vitamin A. And vitamin A is healthy for your eyes. So if you have some sort of um, eye disease, by, um, eating carrots can help you, but eating a lot of carrots is not gonna make your eyes better if you're already like wearing glasses or contacts. Um, that, that, that I don't think um, will happen. That's cool. So if I eat a lot of carrots, my eyesight's not gonna get any better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another question. This is also for you, Stephen, from Isabella, who's 10. They ask, why do we crave certain foods? Yeah, um, that's such a wonderful question. It, it really hits off like this, that relates to the, to the earlier question about, about comfort and feeling. So we crave certain foods when, when we're hungry and our body is telling us that, that we need something. Sometimes it can be as simple as you worked, you worked out a lot and um, you, you, you used a lot of energy, you burned a lot of calories, and now you need more calories to, to bring you back to, to feel in balance. Other times you can be craving really specific nutrients. So like a, a pirate on a, that's been at sea for a long time hasn't had any fresh fruit, might be deficient in vitamin C. And, and this, this person might be craving just like fresh fruit all the time to get this exact micronutrient. Thanks, that's so cool. So we have another question from Ian, who's seven. And they ask, why are avocados not poisonous to humans, but poisonous to other living things like dogs? Uh, avocados poisonous to dogs. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, avocados, I, I think they contain this like specific chemical called person, 
per oh my god is it called I, I really, yeah that's what it's called person but it's p-e-r-s-i-n <laughs> and and this molecule for is is poisonous to most animals but not to humans which is really interesting i'm not really sure why um but I think like animals sort of have like an allergic reaction to, to this chemical the same way that some humans are allergic to peanut butter or, or tree nuts or things like that. So for whatever reason, humans aren't allergic to it, but, but other animals are. That's really cool. Um, we have one more question under this topic, um, which is, is breakfast really the most important meal of the day? Which is by Cecilia, who's 17. Wow. Um, <laughs> so breakfast is important. Um, how you define breakfast may be different. So like if you're defining breakfast as just the meal that you eat in the morning versus how I would define it as the meal that you have, the first meal you have in the day, regardless of time. So it's when you're breaking your fast. So when you're sleeping, you're fasted. And when you some people like to wake up and not eat breakfast. They, they might have their first meal at 2 p.m. But that's 2 p.m. meal is still their breakfast. And it's an important to think about how you're breaking that fast. So you wanna avoid so, sort of like large glucose and insulin spikes. Um, like at that time, you want that meal to like sustain you um, for the rest of the day. So you should be mindful of of what you're eating at, and that fir first meal. Um, and, and yeah, meal, meal timing and, and what you're eating at the time is like a whole, it, it's a whole big topic we can get into. That was really cool. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions. So if you're just joining our Biaba Student Town Hall, my name is Lauren and I'm here with scientists Stephen and Laura and we are taking your questions about food science. So let's take some questions from the chat. Cece? Yes, hi, here's a question from Brandon. He asked, why is caffeine not recommended for kids? Stephen? Caffeine recommended for kids. Um, so caffeine will suppress your appetite and kids need a lot of energy to continue growing. Um, so you want, well, caffeine will also just make, make kids bounce off the walls you spend a lot of energy and also not want to eat. So that can be dangerous in, in like having very low blood sugar. You, again, you want, you want to keep your blood sugar at like a stable level throughout the day. You want to avoid highs and you want to avoid lows. And caffeine is going to make it go real high and real low in a short amount of time, which can be dangerous for kids. So we can take one more question from the chat. Great. So here's a question from Nate, who is 11. He asked, why do, why do citruses come in sections? This question is for Laura. What? I know, Stephen, you've been, you, you got, oh, you've, been nailing it. you've been nailing it, by the way. Um, Nate, Nate wants to know about citrus. So obviously the design of fruit has to be advantageous for reproduction, right? So obviously, fruits are fruits because they're gonna be ingested by something, right? And then the seeds are gonna be pooped out and fertilizer is gonna be around them and then the, a new plant's gonna grow, right? Cause most things are on the planet to, to, especially plants to reproduce. And so as, and I'm not a citrus expert but I can imagine that um, that fleshy part around the seeds, right? Cause when you eat citrus, there's, there are seeds in there, right? So that's to attract things like us eating them and getting rid of them in hopefully a place where they can, they can grow, which we do not do. So that's my short answer on that. Great, great. So we have more science questions and these questions are on the topic of genetically modified foods. The first question comes from Christine, age 39, and they ask, how can you make foods safer using modern methods? And this question is for Laura. Yeah, this, this is a good, good question. I think um, the majority of plants that we eat now and that we consume have been modified in some way genetically. 
And so a lot of people say, well, why is that? Or what is that? But I'll just give you an example of, you know, I think a lot of people have heard about what happened to the Irish potato. There was an Irish potato famine, right? Like a lot of people, there was this weird thing that went through, killed all of the potatoes, and then people fled because there was famine, right? And the same thing is happening all throughout different parts of the African continent and beyond, right? Because there are these pests and diseases that are constantly fighting with the plant itself. And so before any um, technology intervenes, there is low yield, right? Low amounts of, of food will be produced. So our food that we eat and to sustain this massive planet that we have, there are really cool scientists that are finding ways to make plants resistant to pests and pathogens. And those are the things that are really helping us um, feed this gigantic planet that we have of people. So technology, lots of really cool um, scientists doing DNA technology are making plants um, more productive, really. It's about production of food, isn't it? Yeah. Great. And we have another question. And this comes from Lisbeth, H11. And they ask, how do scientists crossbreed foods? And this one is for Laura as well. Elizabeth, 11. I mean, I don't think I was thinking about that stuff at 11, but I'm glad somebody is. So, um, you know, it's interesting when things, different fruit are crossbred. I'm thinking they're talking about some sort of hybrid between an apple and an orange or, or something like that. Um, so really, really the way things reproduce, a lot has to do with the chromosome numbers, right? One of the reasons that cats and dogs don't mate and have offspring is because in this process of, of meiosis, you need chromosomes to match up to make viable things happen, right? So cr making plants hybrid, you really have to work on finding out, are the offspring gonna actually make it, right? Are the, are the chromosomes gonna line up? Are they gonna be viable and all of those sorts of things. So usually people just do a lot of experimentation, right? Fruits come from flowers and they'll take a flower from maybe a, an apple and a flower from an orange tree rub them together and see, see if they produce um, viable offspring, right? So, so it's all about, that's how it happens. Flowers are put together and then you see if there's an actual fruit. Awesome. And we have another question and this question says, how are scientists using 3D printing to make food? What effect is that going to have on our life today? This comes from question age 14 and this one is for Steven. All right. 3D printing and food. So I, I'm definitely not an expert on this, but I, I think that 3D printing would be most used for like lab grown meats. So there's a, there's a field of science going on right now where, where scientists are trying to develop alternative meat products by growing kind of like cells in a lab without whole animal, without the animal. So right now they're just focusing on getting the cost down to be able to, you know, put something like ground beef um, in, in, in the market on the shelves next to real ground meat and hopefully people will, will choose that one, but they need to get the cost of it right. Um, they're, they're starting with things like ground beef because um, the texture will matter a little bit less. But in the future, if we're gonna want like full blown lab grown like steaks, that like the muscle striations are gonna matter. We could use 3D printing um, to maybe do that the same way how 3D printing is being used to kind of build like, like hearts for, for heart transplants or something like that. So that's like a whole field of biology and maybe, maybe they're gonna merge and we'll have this whole kind of future where we're eating steaks that were never part of part of an animal, which, which seems wild. So that's, that's an exciting future. Can I say something about that? Sure. I mean, why not? We're here too. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing that I was just thinking about while you were talking was, I think we're gonna have to be careful that we don't marginalize people even more because that 3D printing requires power and requires all those supplies. So I feel like if that is gonna be a viable thing, we need to make sure that everybody on the planet is gonna have access to that as well. So that's, that's what I just wanted to 
throw out there because I think a lot of times here in the US we get so carried away like just being able to even be on this chat is a privilege right having the internet having power to do this and I sometimes worry that if we go down the road of things that require that too much we might um, really exclude some people that need us to to not that's my two cents absolutely oh, cool absolutely. so another question is how are students how are seedless grapes made? And this one's for Steven. For me? Well, Laura, do you know this one? Steven, I think we're just I, happy. I mean, we can get into a full I genetic mean, session here, but it's yeah. all about genetics, right? And I, selection. <laughs> right. So I, yeah, I, I think I think there's a, it's actually a, a natural mutation in the grape that just produces seedless grapes. Um, and then farmers were able to select this special grape that didn't have any seeds. And how do you breed something that doesn't have a seed? I guess some seeds must have like popped up at some point and they were able to breed them. So we get lots of seedless grapes, but um, it's really actually, seedless? it's a natural mutation. Mm -hmm. Are they really seedless? Like for real? Cause every time I get a grape and it says it's seedless at the supermarket, there's always something in there I'm, that is a seed like thing, but do they do like a propagation thing? where they like don't, they propagate it through cuttings and then throw it in the ground. And so maybe that's how ours, who knows? Cool, so we have one last question and we have the first one is from Ivan, who, Ian, who is seven and it asks, how are per preservatives added to food? How does it affect the body? And the other one is from Ivan, who is seven. What are ultra processed foods? I, I can touch on this and then Laura, maybe you can, can fill in. Um, I think like when, when you're going from sort of like the farm where you're growing the food and then you you have to take it to people, right? So a lot of times this is going to grocery stores and food in order for it not to go bad needs to be preserved and processed in a way to get it from the farm to to the market for us to to then be able to use it in our kitchens so pr preserving food is, is an ancient process of of you know of it, it's an ancient process so we've been doing uh, for as long as humans have been eating we've been trying to preserve preserve food so things like fermentation and salting um salting foods is a way to to preserve it if i have cabbage and it's going to start going bad i can put salt on it it's going to draw out the water and it's going to be preserved for longer and i can eat sauerkraut or i can eat kimchi and, and things like that um so they're they're like these natural preservatives that we've been doing for a long time like salting and then there's sort of chemical preservatives that we've been using a lot more recently that might be a little more iffy so like ultra processed foods like a Twinkies or something like that, right? Like something that can is shelf stable for decades. Um, they're they're they they're these chemical additives that we're not really as confident about their health. They they probably aren't as healthy as the natural preservation techniques that humans have been doing pretty much forever. Not forever. <laughs> Great. Um so if you're joining us at BioBus, if you're joining our BioBus Student Town Hall, my name is Mia and I'm here with scientists Steven and Laura and we're taking questions about food science. Let's take some questions from the chat. Ivy? Okay, so Ina who is 10 and Angie who was also 10 wanted to know if, um, is there something about sweet foods that make me want to eat it every day? And why do we want more sugar as we're eating it? Yeah, I, I can take this one. Um, so we, we talked about nutrients. So we talked about some micronutrients like vitamin C and vitamin A. There's also the macronutrients that are the sugars, fats, and proteins. And sugary food has these carbohydrates that you need to maintain sugar levels in your blood. So your neurons and your brain, which use sugar to to keep going. They don't like to use proteins or fat as the fuel source. So these are fuels for, for energy. So when you eat them, you again, have this like positive association with 
good job eating that. You should eat more because you're, that's what your body wants. Your body wants the energy so you can be a 10 year old and, and play and, and have fun. that answer the question yeah take another question Ivy. okay so laura asks i mean for laura um they have a question that does where your food grow change what it what makes them like the texture or just like the taste hmm. i mean stephen you might have to help me on this one but you know the end game for plants i mean plants are like machines as well right they they take in water taking carbon dioxide and release things as well, right? So if you put pickled juice, let's just say, I mean, you dump pickled juice on a plant, it's not gonna taste like pickled juice, right? Because the plant itself is processing the inputs from the pickled juice to actually make what it needs, right? So I think that soil, of course, is super important for growing plants and the amount of water it gets and if it has access to sunlight and all of those things that are super technical, um, biologically but I understand what what our our chat person is asking like what if you dump barbecue sauce in the soil is it going to taste like barbecue like I get it I totally get it because I think about these things too but when you think about how plants do what they have to do they have cells they do their thing they're trans they're chemically working through moving the input into what they need which is they're producing sugar and releasing oxygen right so that's the um short answer did that answer that I, I also want to add there's this concept in like the culinary world of like terroir right so like where the food was grown so there's a reason why you want like wine from California or champagne from Italy because there's something that makes those grapes special in their unique way that makes the wines different and and we, we're learning more about this like idea of terroir in in the fermentation Fields. So like there are certain bacteria that will live in the US and New York and there's certain and or yeast and there are other ones that will grow will be um, like in France. So if I'm making a baguette in New York and I'm having a natural sourdough starter, the bacteria in my sourdough are going to be different than the bacteria in the sourdough that is being baked in France. And therefore our breads, even if we use the same ingredients, because of our location and because of what is around us is going to change the taste of, of the food. I think that's going to be all of our chat questions for now. So we're going to move on to a new topic, which is food chemistry and the physical makeup of food. So our first question is from Maxie, who's seven, and they ask, is honey ne really never going to go bad? You guys, I had to Google this. I Googled, it wasn't my thing, because I was like, this is interesting. So Google tells me that honey is 80% sugar and 18% water. And so, so, and it's very acidic. So it's, not a very nice medium for bacteria and other things to grow on. So I, I never say never. So I, I wouldn't say that it's never going to go bad because what about the spoon that you put in there? Was it sterilized hundred percent? You know what I'm trying to say? So I think good hygiene going into the honey and coming out of it and using your autoclave that everyone has at their house. That's a joke. That's a science joke. Not appropriate. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, it could, it could stay, stay, I mean, it's better than leaving meat out on the counter, okay? Okay. Steven, okay. cool. do you want to add something real to uh, my, my Google? That's perfect, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, like low water and high sugar is another like method of preserving things so you don't get bacteria and mold and stuff to start growing in there, so. Mm -hmm. It's actually a good transition to our next question, which is from Jenna Christine, who is four, and this is for Steven. They ask, why does food get moldy at all? Right, um, perfect transition, yeah. Um, the, so there's these like, there are microorganisms all around all the time. You don't see them, you'll need like a super nice microscope um, to see them. 
but they want to eat just as much as you want to eat. So if you're leaving bread out on the counter, like the mold is going to come in and start eating and start growing and start dividing and, and do its thing. Um, that mold, like when it's just free rain and you're just letting anything get, get in, could be dangerous. You typically don't want that. But we do do a process where we like actively want certain types of molds or bacteria. And that's like a form of cooking called fermentation. So fermentation is basically cooking with those bacteria. So you can pretend you're like, like a bouncer at a bar, right? And you want certain bacteria to come in, but not other ones. So you set up the gates and you set up those gates by adding things like salt or sugar, or you put it in like high temperature or pressure. So some bacteria can live, the ones that you want in the food, but you, not the harmful ones that are gonna make you sick. Guys, can we just discuss that that was a four-year-old that asked that? How did that happen? That's oh yeah, like, don't, how don't go to bars. <laughs> how did a four-year-old get on the YouTube? That's, I just wanna throw that out there for that. Okay, continue on with the show. I think that's really cool. Um, so we have a question from Ian, who is seven. This is for Steven. And they ask, how do preservatives affect the human body? And are they harmful in any way? Yeah, so we, we touched on this a bit. I mean, preservative, they're all different types of preservatives. And I'm, I'm definitely, I don't, I'm not an expert on like preservative toxicology, but um, I think, yeah, like it would, it's going to depend on the preservative and the amount and how much you're eating. So if you have something once in a while, you're going to be okay. But if you're eating preserved food, well, if I, I don't know, Twinkies just come, come, come to mind because they're like the like ultra processed kind of like thing in my mind um, with tons of preservatives. So I, 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 yeah, I think that's my answer. Just everything in moderation. If you really want that Twinkie, go for it. Like eat, eat your <laughs> ultra processed food, but once in a while, not often. Okay, that's cool. So we have a question, we have another question from Ian. This is also for you, Stephen. And they ask, does food actually have elements like iron in it? How does that work? Totally, yeah. Uh, the food that we eat needs these macro and micronutrients the same way that we need them. So when we're eating the food, we're eating everything that's in the food. Certain foods will have different concentrations of these nutrients. So like dark leafy greens and a vegetable will have high levels of iron. So if you eat a lot of dark leafy greens, there's something that the dark leafy green needs a lot of iron in order to still be a plant, right? Like kale and collard greens and, and, and vegetables like that. And, and animals, there's iron in our muscles, there's iron in our liver. So if you're eating animals that the same way that we need iron, those animals need iron and it's, it's there. So when you eat it, you're eating it. Okay, that's cool. So we have another question from Ian. This is for Laura. And they ask, do plants have DNA and does it work the same way as humans? A shout out to Ian, seven years old, get into business. Okay, um, yes and yes. I mean, that's not really what he wants to hear, but it's true. Plants have DNA and it works the exact same way as humans, right, at human DNA. And the same is true for fungi and bacteria and um, some viruses are DNA viruses. The coronavirus like we're dealing with now is RNA, right? That's an RNA virus and that comes from DNA. Um, and so the building blocks of life are four chemical compounds, A, A T, G, and C, which are ring structures of stuff. But um, yes, it's the same way. An interesting thing that's being discussed now is the epigenome, which is these environmental factors. Because people say, oh, how can twins grow up in the same place in the same way? Like identical twins, and they look different, right? And then maybe one was in London and one was in New York. And now people are starting to uncover this, um, what they are calling the epigenome um, that has some it has a lot of influence over, over what makes something a living something. 
that's that. That's really cool. So now we're gonna move on to some chat questions. Cece? Yeah, um, there are a lot of great questions. I can't honestly keep up with them, uh, but let me ask you guys a few. Here is one from Ruby who is 16. She asked, why is oil in food bad for the body? It's not. <laughs> um, we need fat in our diets. It's super, super important. It's one of the three major macronutrients. All of our cells in our body um, have cell membranes that are built off of fat. Um, we need fat to produce like the hormones um, that we need to com communicate. Oil is fat, right? Um, oil and fat are, are the same and, and they're, they're just different types. Um, and what we, we need that in our diet to, to, to produce the cells and to do the signaling that, that we have in our body. So what's dangerous about oils and fat is that it's the highest, it's the most dense calorically per volume of, of, of the macronutrients. So when you eat a little bit of it, it can be a lot of energy. And when you have too much of the energy, it gets put into storage. Um, and that's how you start getting fat. And that, and they, those, those fats can also um, cause like inflammation and start getting you sick if it has too much, but you need a percentage of it in your diet for sure. That's really interesting. I didn't actually, I didn't know that. So we have enough, can we ask, can we get another question from the chat CC? Uh, yeah, here's one for Steven. Uh, there's one that asks, how do you keep blood sugars levels stable throughout the day? That's a really brilliant question. Um, so you have to do a lot of like personal monitoring. So I can't tell you like eat this food, eat that food because everyone's response to the same food could be different. Uh, it's, there's really interesting studies on this where they put continuous glucose monitors on people and they measure how their glucose goes up and down. And one person can eat a banana and another person can eat a cookie and they'll have drastic different responses. So to say you should eat only bananas, you're actually like telling some people who would, that you're actually hurting some people that like the banana is going to cause high glucose spikes. Whereas the cookie will actually like Complete, will be fine, will normal, will we'll keep their glucose um, kind of steady throughout the day. So um, there's no like perfect answer to that question. Generally, like um, people recommend like high fiber will, high fiber foods. So salads are non-soluble fibers that are, that are good to regulate glucose, but also soluble fibers like oatmeal. So if you eat like starchy foods like oatmeal, will will keep you um, more stable. But it could be it, you have to just know your body. If you're just, sorry, if you're just joining our Vibo Student Town Hall, my name is Lauren, and I'm here with two scientists, Stephen and Laura. What do you want to know about food science? Put your questions in the chat, and we'll ask them to the scientists. Great. Um, we have more questions, more scientific questions, and the topic is on chemical reactions in food. The first question we have is, what makes food spicy? Why are foods extremely spicy for some people and not for others? This comes from Julia, who is 17, and this one is for Steven. Both questions uh, are for Steven. I can, I can, Laura might know a little bit more on this, but um, so, the vegetable, so like spice comes from a molecule called capsaicin that like certain vegetables started to develop as like an evolutionary mechanism to, to make sure some animals don't eat them to survive. Um, we've sort of like cultivated that with farming and humans turned that upside down and started to love spicy foods. But <laughs> um, that that's... That, was that the question? What, why, why are spicy food? What, what's spicy food? So there's this molecule capsaicin that makes things spicy and it sort of like hits our taste receptors on our tongue. Sometimes it's a little painful. Um, 
Uh, some people like that. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's, that's. Laura, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, you know what, I, I mean, you answered the question about why they're spicy. There's, there's a molecule in there that makes them spicy, but I got to, wanted to tell a story about, you know, the first time I went to Kenya, um, I met some scientists from Eritrea and they were just very excited and, and very proud of the fact that some of the, the hottest, hottest chilies in the world come from that part of the world. So um, it's really fascinating, not only is it spicy, but to see sort of the evolution of how people have, uh, uh, you know, they prefer the spice to like, if you go to different parts of East Africa, people don't want any of the spice. So it's really, food evolution and how spice has been taken up and what people like is really fascinating as well. I mean, certain parts of India have really boast for really spicy things as well. So, um, and then there must be something physiologically that we kind of co-evolve with, whether we can handle the spice or not, you know, people get hot and then they sweat and, you know, there's all of these really fascinating things as um, evolution of, of spice or no spice as well. So that's what I those are my anecdotal things about spice. I mean, and I'm in Arizona and I mean, we do some spice here in our Mexican food. That's all I'm gonna say. Awesome. So we have another question and it's from, from Christian and they ask, when, when you cook food, what changes inside? And this is for either oh, one man. of the scientists. Oh man, so many things. Oh, uh, it's... <laughs> Um, so like what happens when you cook food? I mean, it's going to depend on the food that you're cooking and, and how you're cooking it. Um, but uh, essentially, usually when we're cooking foods, we're trying to make it more edible for us and more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More like bioavailable for us to eat. So certain vegetables eaten raw, they're not going to taste very good and they just need to be cooked in order to bring out the nutrients and for us to like better eat it. Um, uh, I think that's, that's like the short answer of it, like without kind of like specifics about like what happens to this food. And I can go into like what, at what temperature, like things happen in cookies, <laughs> but uh, maybe I'll save that for another time. <laughs> yeah, get some more questions. Amazing. So we have one more question, and this is from Larry, he's 73, and he asks, why can some people eat the burnt stuff at the bottom? But you Larry, you can you, Larry, you can also eat the burnt stuff on the bottom. <laughs> it's it's going to be okay. Um, anyone can do it. I think people are afraid of, like, burnt stuff being, like, carcinogenic. I think there are some studies that showed that, but when they did those studies, they're, like, much higher concentrations of whatever that molecule is than you would ever get from eating like maybe don't eat like completely carcin carcinogen yeah um um yeah uh, that's 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 my answer to that great so if you're just joining our bible student town hall, my name is mia and i'm here with two scientists steven and laura why don't what don't you want? What do you want to know about food and science? Put them in the chat, and we'll ask them to the sciences. Let Let's take some questions from the chat. Ivy. Okay. So Dina asked, "Can you explain the concept of super tasters and how they affect someone's experience with the food?" Yeah. So I think that's a really great question. Um, super tasters have like insane abilities like on their tongue. So their taste receptors on their tongue and their super tasters have very sensitive taste receptors. So when they eat certain foods, they can taste like more, like a larger spectrum of, of taste than maybe not a super taster would. But they, they can also be more sensitive to things. So like if there is like a spicy food, they might not like it because the spice might be just too intense um, for, for them. Take another question. Yeah, another question um, is from Hannah. She is an adult and she says, does the body process animal protein differently from the plant protein? 
animal proteins from plant protein? Not really. Um, like our bodies don't really know um, <laughs> where, 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 where the protein is coming from. Like when you start, so this question is really about digestion and digestion is the process of breaking down the food. So we eat foods and they come in these, in how, how they come and they, they're, there's all these big macronutrients and their cells. We need to like break it down. So then certain, so for proteins, they, they, they get broken down into specific amino acids. And then the, the proteins are made up of a string of smaller parts and the smaller parts are called amino acids. So once the protein is sort of broken down into its constituent parts, the amino acid of like, let's say alanine or glutamate in an animal is the same as the glutamate and the alanine from an animal. So we're going to move on to our next topic, which is food consumption. Our first question is from Taylor, who's 10 and Abdiel. Taylor asks, can you survive by only eating fat? And Abdiel asks, does everything make you fat? <laughs> uh you cannot survive by only eating fat. Um, you definitely need the other nutrients like protein and, and carbohydrates um, because those are the building blocks of, of your body. So fat was one component, it's the cell membranes and, and hormones and things like that, but you also need sugars, our brain feeds on sugars and, you, and most of the signaling molecules of most of the hormones and kind of the whole machinery is built around proteins, uh, how to, how to replicate. So just eating fat's not going to do it. And, and the question on, does everything make you fat? Um, no, <laughs> um, the, you, you really will only get fat if you're eating an excess of calories, um, based off of how much you're expending. So when you're expending energy and you're eating energy, if they're in balance, you're going to stay the same weight. If you eat more than you're expending, you're going to gain weight. And if you eat less than you're expending, you're going to lose weight. So um, it, it, for, for kids that are growing, you want to be in, uh, cal like eat more calories so you can continue growing. We have um, another question. Cumber and Taylor, who are 10, both want to know, why are calories really important? And Taylor also wants to know, can you take away calories from a food that are removing a portion of the food? I mean, I can talk about calories since I spend a lot of time, you know, it's interesting to think about calories and we are so in such a privileged space in the US. I mean, I, I'm not saying that there aren't children here that are really struggling for calories, but there are a lot of places in the world where there just aren't enough calories to do anything in a day. So um, I forgot, okay, calories are super important, right? For growth, I mean, there's a huge portion of the population, the global population that is stunted, right? I don't know if many of you know about stunting, but there are a lot of children around the world that just don't develop properly. Their brains don't develop and, and many, many, um, learning challenges come up from not having enough calories. And so I think that calories are super important. And, um, you know, I think that this idea of fat is also really interesting because that concept globally, like when you go, when I go to places on the African continent, I'm never seen as fat, I'm seen as healthy, right? But I am in the US and some people say you're fat, but then like, let's say you go to Thailand and there's this other beauty of all these different things. So I think that keeping the calorie thing and the idea of being fat in perspective as to what it really means because in the end, having enough food is an amazing, amazing advantage on the planet. And um, I don't know what else I'm supposed to ask about, but calories are important. And I think that perspective that everybody doesn't have enough is super important to drive us forward to secure the entire planet with food is my big challenge to our YouTube peeps. So, I know I'm old, I said peeps, whatever. We have another question from Taylor, who's 10. This is for you, Laura, again. And they ask, is it possible to expand the expiration date of food? Is it possible to expand the expiration date of food? Okay, I just wanna give a side note here. 
my mother keeps salad dressing in the fridge for probably 10 years, like legit. My friends come over and they just automatically, it's a joke that they say, my mom's name is Mary. Mary, what's the expiration date on this? So my mother clearly has proven that you can have salad dressing 10 years over the expiration date. So there's that info for you and there's data. It's right in there in my mom's fridge, done. Refrigeration is a powerful thing. So keeping things cool, gonna keep it good. I mean, she would she would use it anyway, but that's a whole nother story. That's cool. Okay, so this is our last question for today. It's from Christian, who's 14. And they ask, what is the evolution of food today? Is there a difference in how people make it or cook it? Food, I, I, food is always evolving and food will continue to always be evolving. It's, it's, it's what, it's such a like integral part of, of culture because we, every region of the earth, every family has their own sort of like cultural way that they cook. And it's, it's, it's always evolving and it's always changing. So having, having chefs that share their culture and, and can, can expand it um, will, will continue to, to, to make like how we cook food um, evolve. Yeah. I agree. And I think that the, if you really think about the number of plants we actually eat, and these key staple crops, there aren't very many of them, right? And it's amazing what humans have done to make them into so many fascinating dishes. So yeah, I've enjoyed going back to where we all started um, and seeing how people cook and how it unites people. So, and I just love food, so whatever. Agreed, agreed. I mean, why not? Great, so that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to everyone for joining us in another student town hall and to everyone who submitted questions. We appreciate our guest science today guest scientists, Stephen and Laura, for answering our questions. Make sure to take our survey and share your feedback on the link provided in the chat. Bio Buzz bought everything online so we can still create a warm and welcoming space for people to learn about science, practice research, and make discoveries. Catch our weekly student town halls every Thursday on Bible to hang out and learn with sciences. Our topic next week, next week is on evolution. Start sending in your questions now at biobus.org slash townhall. See you live next Thursday at 1 p.m. to learn new things about topics of evolution. Join a remote lab class with Biobus scientists and tools in our Discover at Home program. Or try and experiment and share your research with our Ford Home Science Challenges. You can learn more about all of this at biobus.org. Check out the link in the description below. Find more info at www.biobus.org and follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using our handle at biobus to discover at home with us. Thanks. See you next time. Bye. Now, um, we're going to play a Kahoot if you guys want to. Um, below, Hamza would send in the um, Kahoot. And... I shall create the room for Kahoot. And if you want, you guys can join too. We got our first player, Eden. 
Thea Tater. Salem Alicum. Hi, join the game. Along with Wild Goose. Too old for this, join the game. Along with burger, fries, and pizza joined. Is that your favorite food? Hey, join the game too. Along with Sonic. Once 10 players join, we'll start the game. I guess we'll start then. Okay, so all these questions are going to be 30 seconds to answer, and they're going to be all food science based. So which food has the highest protein? And it is chicken breast to answer for that question. And pizza, fries, and, um, and burger is in first place with 503 points. So this question is, what is the study of mushrooms called? So don't get fooled by fungology or mushology. The answer is my mycology. And burger, fries, and pizza is still in first place, while too old for this is going for second place. Is avocado a fruit? True or false? So it is true, avocado is a fruit. Ooh, burger, fries, and pizza went down to second place and too old for this is taking his place. Humans and chimpanzees share roughly how much DNA?
Okay, so see a tater took burger from Fries and Peaks' spot. And too old for this is still in first place. Flour cooked together with fat is known as what? So flour cooked together with fat is known as rooks. Too old for this is still in first place and see a tater lost her shriek. What food is hummus made from? Gelatin seems tempting. So the answer is chickpea. Now we shall move on to the next question. See a tater took too old for this spot. And Burger, fries, and pizza is still in third place. Let's see he, if he can redeem himself. Is tomato fruit true or false? So tomato is a fruit, so it is true. Burger, fries, and pizza took his second place for too old for this, and see a tater still remains on top. What is boba made of? So we skipped that question and the answer for that one was gorgonzola and Tia Tater is still in first place along with burger, fries and pizza in second place. We shall move on to the next question. And it is, if beak is cooked in brochet, what does that mean?
five, four, three, two, one. And it meant on skewers. See a tater is still in first place. Which festival is known as Corgat? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And the answer was zucchini. See a tater is still in first place. Ooh, Sonic Life went up. Let's see if he can steal third or fourth place. We are on our 12th question. What is soy sauce main ingredient? So the main ingredient is soybean. The 13th question is, what is the main ingredient in gingerbreads? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. The answer was flour. Surprisingly, it is not cinnamon or ginger, even though it says ginger in the name. See a tater is still in first place. We are on the 14th question. And it says, which country produced the most strawberries in 2016? So the answer was China, not USA or Mexico or Puerto Rico, it's China. Ooh, Wild Goose is in third place, while Sia Tater still remains in first. 15, who made the phrase junk food? Michael Jordan, Hamza Lamir, Alexander Hamilton, or Michael Jacobson. So the answer was Michael Jacobson. Sadly not Michael Jordan. Ooh, Sia Tater lost his spot and Wild Goose is in first place. Let's move on to the next question. So the 16th question is, a field of rice is known as? A patty or the rice fields?
So the answer is Patty. And Wild Goose is on a three win streak. Let's see if see a Tater can catch up. The 17th question is, is strawberry a fruit? So strawberry is a fruit. And no, do not get tricked. It is a truly a fruit. And Wild Goose is on a four wing streak. True or false? Is it dangerous to drink too much water? So drinking too much water can be dangerous. There's a certain amount of water that you have to drink a day, which is recommended. And Wild Goose is on a five win streak and Sonic Iffy is in third place. Too old for this is going down. Let's see if he can remake his place. For the 19th question is, is ketchup a jelly? So it is false, it is truly false. And Wild Goose still remains with his streak or her streak. And for the 20th question, are gorillas vegan? That means that they do not eat animal-based food. So it is true, they are vegan. Um, due to time, we'll have to cut the quiz short. And I'm sorry about the lag. It, um, it's because we're streaming and it, there's a lag in between when we're recording and when you guys are seeing it. So Lauren or um, Mia, if you want to say anything or add anything. We hope everyone learned something from that game and we do apologize for any like lag because I know that would probably be really annoying if you knew the answer but couldn't answer the question. But there we do have top three in third place it was Sonic Ife. Um second place Sia Tater and first place Wild Goose with seven thousand five hundred and fifty-four points. And thank you to all our amazing high school student junior scientists who made this happen. Give yourselves a round of applause. Can we get some clapping in the chat? Amazing.